Hello everyone, today we are going to discuss a chapter from the book Culture and Anarchy by Matthew Arnold called Sweetness and Light. So, this is part of a book Culture and Anarchy that Matthew Arnold published in 1869. So, you must remember the historical condition that was that England was going through at that time. I mean in 1859 Charles Darwin had published his groundbreaking book The Origin of Species. So, it was uh, as Freud calls it one of those trademark events in the history of human uh, in the history of humans that kind of put a stop or question the authority that humans thought they had upon their own lives and their surroundings. It showed that we were not uh, a part of God's creation or something, but that we had evolved over time as any other species and that humans held no kind of special place in the order of things in society. So, but also in this time we see that in the Victorian era the colonial, um, the colonial expeditions of the British Empire had spread a lot and there was the uh, industrial revolution taking place which had also created a lot of uh, industries in England and a lot of factories and we see in writings of like Charles Dickens how these industries, this birth, this um, faith in machinery kind of brought out a new aspect of civilization. It was one of those trademark events in civilization, it was one of those events that had changed humanity again forever. So, we see that Arnold, Matthew Arnold here is writing from a very, very poignant time, uh, place in time, a spot of time where he has to make certain, certain very important observations for human society or human culture to continue as it were. Otherwise, he is seeing that this certain moves from the classical um, values in society that there are moves happening. He says that capitalism is slowly coming in. So, the values that previously people had of culture, it is little waning a little bit while people are running more after money, more after wealth, more after outside grandeur than inside development. So, Arnold wants to here introduce culture as a force that helps us to not only express our external riches, not only to express our external wealth, but also to cultivate our inner life, uh, an inner culture that will help us to outgrow our affinity for this outward ex expression of our well-being. And that is that's where he is coming in. And so, if we look at this and in this book Culture and Anarchy, um, Arnold had divided the English society into three aspects. The upper class were called the barbarians who had a lot of money, but did not have the time to think about society, did not have the time to think what would make it better. The Philistines, the middle class which he believed had the actual potential to change society as it were, but they were too enmeshed in other ideological activities to cultivate culture, to understand what importance culture had in society. And the third were the populace and the populace were for according to the lower rung of society whom the Philistines had to educate. So, here we see that culture's view and Arnold's view of culture is also a very evangelical, a very proselytizing view. It is almost like um, a view of a Christian missionary who believes in the faith or in, in, in the supremacy of his own religion so that he can go out in the world and spread it. But here also uh, Arnold tries his best to post culture as a very secular phenomenon as opposed to a religious phenomenon. And as we shall see through our reading of the text, how Carl, uh, Arnold kind of compares and contrasts religion in contemporary Victorian society and its role in how culture should be perceived. So, let us um, get into the text and how we will do it, we will read key passages from the text and then we will discuss a little bit on them because uh, Arnold is very lucid and very, his writing style in this essay is very clear and uh, very entertaining to read. So, I would suggest that we actually read Arnold to see what he says in interesting parts and then we will add some commentary to it to elucidate it on further. So, the, uh, the sweetness and light, the essay or the chapter starts with uh, uh, reference to what culture was commonly perceived in contemporary Victorian society. He says that the disparages of culture, post culture as a thing of a badge of honor, as a badge of value like it is something that if I have culture it sets me apart from other people, it makes me a better person in a sense that it is an, uh, an, an, an effort in elitism, not as in a 
an effort in social well-being. So, Arnold is first kind of hitting at that sort of elitism, that culture is not a tool of elitism, that culture does not make someone elite to make them different from the other people in society. Whereas, culture's main function is a more social function, it is a very socialist function that if I have culture, then I must, uh, I must help others to cultivate it and it is not something that is very passive, it is not something that comes to us from outside, it is something that is very active that we must always cultivate. So, that cultivate aspect in culture is very much highlighted by Arnold in this essay. So, he is saying that this is not a culture that prides itself on a smattering of Greek and Latin. So, here we see that the English culture, the English idea, the English identity is slowly kind of asserting itself more and more. It is coming out of the values that people had previously placed on Latin and Greek and English as a language, English as a source of pride, Englishness as a source of pride is slowly coming out. And he is saying that no serious man would call this culture or attach any value to it as culture at all. So, Arnold is talking about serious men, serious men of culture who are dealing with culture in society. So, here we see another aspect of culture here is that he calls it what uh, and we will keep doing this throughout the essay, we will kind of try to relate Arnold's thinking to much later thinkers, maybe postmodern thinkers like Foucault, Deleuze and try to see how he relates to them, how he relates to many contemporary thinkers in helping us understand our own society better. So, this is not as I would like to mention a very timed essay, this is a very much pertinent essay even for our own times and as we will read through it, we will understand the pertinence of the essay that it still holds today. So, and he also begins by saying that many people in the English society have held uh, curiosity to be a very a bad virtue that curiosity is not a good thing, but he says that this is something that is very typical of the British that many are people from other cultures, they do not think of curiosity like that. They have two ideas of curiosity, one is just uh, like the one that probably is best expressed in the aphorism that curiosity killed the cat, it is a meaningless curiosity, it is a nosiness in others people business that should not be allowed. But he is saying that curiosity is also a curiosity for the faculties of the mind, for understanding how, how the mind works. But he is also saying that curiosity, another kind of curiosity would be a looking into the faculties of the mind, how the mind works and how it can as he mentioned in the previous page that Montesco mentions, how it can make an intelligent being yet more intelligent. So, culture as we see Arnold will constantly point to us, it is not a pro process of being, but a process of becoming. Mm, and here again as we can see in the uh, writings of Deleuze and Gattari that they also say that when they are defining the rhizome, they say that it is the rhizome more than it is a process of being, it is a process of becoming, it is a process of forever growing. So, Culture for Arnold was a form of like that, it was not where we stand, but where we should be standing, but where we like it is a it is a scope for immense growth, for infinite growth, a potential. So, here also we see that he says that culture is then properly described uh, not as having its origin in curiosity, but as having its origin in the love of perfection, it is a study of perfection. So, we see that um, Arnold starts giving us descriptions or definitions of what he thinks of culture at the outset, he thinks that it is a love of perfection, it is a study of perfection. So, in uh, this whole writing we see these terms coming up, love, beauty. So, it is an aesthetic plane where Arnold places culture, it is not a very utilitarian plane where in, in, in Victorian times we see there are many utilitarian philosophers who is coming in, one of them was Bentham and Arnold will come to Bentham, but for him culture is not a very utilitarian thing, it is not something that has very outward use, but inward use, but at the same time if everyone can um, everyone can practice culture at that level, then we can have a more uh, grown up society where we can match the outward growth with the inward growth, so that the outward growth does not look like a protrusion, does not look like a monstrous growth. And here also quotes Bishop Wilson to say that to make reason and the will of God prevail, only where is the position of doing so good is apt to be overestimated in determining the reason and the will of God. And he then goes on to critique that uh, freedom of speech is not freedom of speech unless we have something good to say. If we do not have something good to contribute, then 
saying anything will not make a difference and we should not exercise that kind of freedom of speech says that and it can remember that acting and instituting are of little use unless we know how and what we ought to act and institute so he's saying that culture is a form of pedagogical form it's a, it's a pedagogical institute which can teach us how to act how to institute and how to carry ourselves better and so and here again we see that even though color um, Arnold brings in uh, Bishop Wilson and starts to compare culture with religion. He also starts com contrasting culture with religion. So, this becomes a very important passage. Where was the hope of making the reason and the will of God prevail among people who had a routine which they had christened reason and the will of God in which they were inextricably bound and beyond which they had no power of looking. So, he is saying that at a point of time religion and every other social institution had created walls, had created boundaries, had created boundaries around us beyond which we could not look, where we were forbidden like do not look at beyond that, do not look at beyond that person. I mean we can see that exemplified in the biblical narrative of eating the apple of in the garden of Eden. So, there were many prohibitions in place in society before which he is seeing right now that they are yielding as he mentions has wonderfully yielded the iron force of exclusion of all which is new has wonderfully yielded. So, we see that Arnold is already bringing in the word iron. So, he is saying that the previous modes of social construction were kind of shackling us were con constraining us into places where we should not be where the horizon should open up and as we have already mentioned that the Victorian time was a time of great learning it was a time of great expansion and Arnold is not criticizing the expansion Arnold is not saying that that expansion should not happen in learning and in some senses we can see that Arnold does not provide a critique of colonialism either. So, we can see that there is a certain amount of collusion that he might have with the project of co colonialism because he is for any sort of expansion. But what he says is that culture should be used to kind of give a margin to those expansions to make us think that where the expansion is good and where that expansion is bad and how much faith we should put on that expansion. Now then is the moment for culture to be of service. Culture which believes in making reason and the will of God prevail, believes in perfection, is the study and pursuit of perfection and is no longer debarred by a rigid invisible exclusion of whatever is new from getting acceptance for its ideas simply because they are new. So, culture heralds the new, culture wants the new, culture is not a study of things that have been from the past, but it is as, as already mentioned it is a process of becoming, it is a process of accepting things that are new in society and it is a belief in perfection. So, as already mentioned that Arnold relates these key words that we must remember with relation to culture, perfection. It is a pursuit of perfection as we said that it is not only being, but also becoming. So, it is not about being perfect, but all, always about the prospect of becoming more, more and more perfect because perfection is a project that can never have an end. And here he brings in religion again and he says that religion is the greatest and most important of the efforts by which the human race has manifested this impulse to perfect itself. So, Arnold here is not critiquing religion as an outmoded institution, but he considers it as one of the institutions that has helped human beings to get to their best, um, to be their best. I mean, if we look at all the art and all the architecture that religion has inspired over the years, and we will be amazed to find that it has inspired in human beings a, a sense of beauty. It has uh, created in human beings a pursuit of beauty which they have followed and it has manifested itself in beautifully like the best religious books are also very good works of poetry temples mosques and churches they are beautiful works of architecture so religion has also helped us to hone our skills for beauty our our um, our aim for beauty and he says like the kingdom of god is within you and culture in like manner places human perfection in an internal condition so we see like um, carnal constantly contrasts that outward appearance of thing and an inward condition of things. So, he again brings that the kingdom of God is within us that we are the temple of God and what a, what could be a better way to take care of this temple than probably indulge in culture a little bit understand what culture wants to say to us. He says it is a general harmonious expansion of those gifts of thought and feeling which make the peculiar dignity, wealth and happiness of human nature. And he says 
it is a, in making endless additions to itself i would like to draw your attention to the to the way he repeats the term endless here in the endless expansion of its powers it's a growing and becoming so here again we see that the word endless is coming in and with again related to the idea of deleuze and gattari that they pose of the body without organs the body without organs that can expand that can expand without boundaries it is also an endless and they also compare modern capitalism with as a body without organs and here we see that this endlessness that uh, arnold brings into culture is also ready being seen in other aspects of society so colonial expansion was an endless expansion the british had reached all the corners of earth they had conquered many parts of land and it was an endless project they were continuing to grow it was not a time when they were shrinking the shrinking would start only after the modern period and after the second world war but this is a time when it's increasing the primacy of the british culture is increasing so he's at at that point he's saying that culture must also be an endless nature that culture is also a process of growing and becoming at all times it's not something that should stop and he said that this is where it coincides with religion because religion has also been with human beings uh, since almost the beginning of time and here he brings a very nice um, point that perfection as culture conceives it is not possible while the individual remains isolated the individual is obliged under pain of being stunted and enfeebled so he is saying that culture is not only a harmonious growth of all our faculties but harmonious growth of all the faculties in all the people in society so the project of culture the aim of culture will only succeed not only when there is a harmonious expansion in the individual but when there is every individual is also in the same way in a similar manner taken into a harmonious expansion of this culture so he, what he brings forward is a very again as i point out a very socialist idea of culture that it is not something that is restricted to the elite it's not something that is a badge of honor that separates certain people from other people but it teaches our, us to teach, to take every person as equal every person with equal rights and it teaches us that we must impart this views of culture to everyone else again but as i said that this can have some proselytizing uh, connotations in it but arnold kind of tries to skirt that going there because he tries to put culture in a secular plane all the time so here he gives a very beautiful description of culture if culture then is a study of perfection and of harmonious perfection general perfection and perfection which consists in becoming something rather than in having something so here also is undermining the idea of possession that possession can be of some importance to us in an inward condition of the mind and spirit not an outward set of circumstances so see the binaries he is creating inward versus outward not in an out outward set of circumstances it is clear that culture instead of being the frivolous and useless thing which mr bright so is also critiquing in the essay some other view other people in his society who were opposed to the culture and were kind of pro proposing that the mechanical aspects of uh, the british society should be taken forward it's something that should be taken proud of pride of and arnold constantly points to their views and says that no this mechanistic expansion is not something that we can take pride of and as an end to itself so we'll come to that so mr bright and mr frederick harrison and many other liberals are apt to call it as a very important function to fulfill for mankind so culture has an important function to fulfill for mankind as he points out here and he is saying that the uh, why do we need culture more than the people of greece and rome needed it because he is saying the culture of the modern time so he is already kind of hinting that the societies have entered modern times so how we understand modern times and and as we shall see in later literature of um, Eliot of Joyce that they are describing even Virginia Woolf the modern writers they are describing human beings as mechanized they are describing human functions as being mechanized so we see that Arnold had kind of foreseen that this society is going to change into something like that and he had already tried to speak against this mechanization of every faculty in society but somehow it was an uh, like culture probably had had to give lot of ground to this mechanical expansion as it still has to do now because we'll see that 
the value that people place in humanities has receded as opposed to other kind of vocational arts where production becomes very important. So, we see that this is an onslaught that has been happening for a long time and Arnold in this um, essay critics liberalism as one of the main forces that sidelines culture and brings this sort of mechanical production to the front. And we will see that right now we are in a position of neoliberal neoliberalism where in neoliberal societies the humanities are kind of downplayed, the, the importance of humanities itself is downplayed and as we see that culture is related to human perfection and to humanities in uh, this essay, but the flow of history has it happened has been constantly trying to downplay this because only at that cost can the value of outward reaches, the value of outward gains can be promoted. And we see that in today's social media platforms and everything there is a sort of um, exhibitionism that goes on. So, that exhibitionism is something that Arnold these days would have the, in, even in those days would have been very critical and something that he probably foresaw before it even came to being. And he is criticizing this terms, this terminology like every man for himself. We will see that once the America, American independence was achieved in the North America and the North American idea as propounded by Thoreau, Emerson, they had a very strong idea, very strong idea of the individual to put forward that the individual Emerson has an essay called self-reliance. So, the individual should rely on the self and there is an infinite scope for growth of the individual that the individual and this has this libertarianism, this liberalism has given rise to modern capitalism where we see that uh, 1 percent of the population has access to 99 percent of the wealth. So, this every man for himself has created a society for of, of inequality where people who achieve wealth, who accumulate wealth are not looking after people who do not have it, are not imparting it and Arnold believes that culture could have taught us how to create a more just society. And he is saying that um, the people of culture even in those days they will be much oftener be regarded for a great while to come as elegant or spurious Jeremias. And, he, and we see that is, he is like the Jeremiah image is very important here, Jeremiah was a prophet. Um, and we see that he is saying that for a great while to come people of culture will be regarded as spurious Jeremiah. So, we see here that he is making a, uh, he's making a prophecy almost, he is making, uh, we see here that he is making a prophecy. Un, not unlike a prophet and he is saying that we will be called Jeremiah. Now, we see that again this problematic idea of proselytizing is coming in, but we must see another thing that culture as opposed to religion as a monolithic religion, he, uh, Arnold does not say that culture originates from some core ideas or some core beliefs or some person or the some holy words. Culture is more like uh, to Arnold what Foucault would later call discursive. Discursive as in it is not dependent on a single author or the edicts of a single author, but it is a combination of all that is written in society, all that is thought in society, all that goes is in currency in society. So, as we will see in postmodern times there is this idea of Barth says about the death of the author, Foucault questions what is an author and says an author function and he questions for discourse then an author function. So, here also Arnold process culture as a discursive field where it is not the sayings of one or two person, it is a saying of all the good things he mentions that all the good things that all the good people in society have said. So, culture is a combination of all that, it is not what a monolithic person has said, but it is all that is being said around the world. And he says that faith in machinery as I said is our besetting danger. And uh, for machinery, he gives some example, what is freedom but machinery, what is population but machinery, what is coal but machinery, what are railroads but machinery, what is wealth but machinery and what are religious organizations but machinery. So, here we see that Arnold is already kind of approaching the criticism that modern times would have uh, of against um, organized religion and he is kind of questioning against that kind of organized religion. And his critique of machinery is uh, very important here because he poses machinery as something that is opposed to culture, not because people are using machinery, but people are using machinery as an end to themselves. And Arnold is saying that we must look at machinery as how they are. They are means, but they are not the ends themselves. It is the problem when we make the means and ends in themselves that this issue arises to him. 
and he is mentioning a Mr. Roebuck who says that may not every man in England say what he likes. Again, we are brought back to the idea of free speech where Arnold had mentioned that free speech is only valid when we have something important to contribute to society. This He says, unless what men say, when they may say what they like is worth saying, has good in it and more good than bad. So we see that um, even these days there are some flippant comments that are made in social media uh, that are reported and a lot of um, a lot of trouble comes up because of that. So he's saying that we must um, we must enact a sort of restriction as what we want to say, as what we need to say, and see if it will have a more better impact on society than a worse impact. And he's saying that this man is saying that greatness lies in coal and railroad, but he's saying that Arnold is saying that what is greatness? He's asking and he's answering that greatness is a spiritual condition worthy to excite love, interest and admiration. And the outward proof of possessing greatness is that we excite love, interest and admiration. Now we might uh, ask the fact that there are different kinds of people in society who might admire different kind of people. So why would we get to a homogeneity like that? But we must also remember again Arnold's idea of culture that is a very uh, that must pervade all the aspects of society. That is why he is saying that it must be a very harmonious growth among all people because then only when we have a certain understanding of culture, we will know what to admire and what not to admire and that is very important in this essay. And he is saying that in a very um, profiting and a doomsday prophet type of way that if England were swallowed by the sea tomorrow and it is something that we are saying as global warming is looming near, as ice caps are melting, this kind of possibilities are really being enacted in movies already and people are starting to kind of see that, that the water levels might rise and so here we see again a very, very dark prophetic side of Arnold that he says that if the seas were to cover England and he is saying that what will uh, the historians of future find more, uh, more entertaining, more uh, enthralling in England? The England of the Victorian era or the uh, 20 years around uh, the time that he is writing or the England of the Elizabethan era where coal, railroad were not that important but a sort of understanding of culture was more in currency. So, he is more questioning for an Elizabethan England than a current of Victorian England where culture has suffered a serious blow. And again he is criticizing wealth, he is saying that our greatness and welfare are proved by our being so rich and here he has a huge problem that being rich to him has nothing to do with being culturally superior or being a better person. So, he would be a very important prophet for our times also where there is a certain of the certain kind of control that the rich exercise in society in what we should learn, what we should not learn, what learning would have would have make us more money. So, riches and wealth is kind of dominating what we should do in society these days, but according to culture that uh, according to Arnold that should not be that riches and wealth they should not be ends, but just means to something and he regards wealth as machinery also here. And here he gives the first explanation of what he means by the Philistines. He is saying that the people who believe most that our greatness and welfare are proved by our being very rich and who most give their lives and thoughts to becoming rich are just the very people we call Philistines. Culture says consider these people then, this, is, this has a very biblical tone here, their way of life their habits, their manners, the very tones of their voice, look at them attentively, observe the literature they read. So, he is saying that these Philistines, he is critiquing these Philistines that they are always possessed with the idea of becoming rich, of the idea of becoming wealthy and he is saying that look at what they read, look at what they understand and he is saying that this pursuit of being rich, this pursuit of being wealthy has kind of hollowed out their internal spiritual lives where there is no growth, but it has kind of it is like a tumorous growth that is happening on the outside, but there is only deadness inside. And he is saying that would any amount of wealth be worth having with the condition that one was to become just like the by just like these people by having it and thus culture begets a dissatisfaction. 
it is a dissatisfaction with the wealthy and industrial community and which saves the future as one may hope from being vulgarized even if cannot save the present and we see that it has that these problems have continued into the future and that is why I, I pointed out that this essay is very pertinent for our times also where we have this inordinate amount of pursuit of riches, the pursuit of wealth where people like Jeff Bezos accumulate a huge amount of money that, that is not even possible for a person to spend. And, but what our society is even these days doing is instead of calling it out as vulgar, instead of calling it out as an inordinate amount of holding, we are putting those people as ideals, those, uh, uh, those people as ideals to where we might must reach. So, the Philistines, the middle class that Arnold critics in this essay is still almost in the same path, they have not diverted from that path and that is why this essay becomes very important to study. And here he again uh, calls out bodily health and vigor and population as machinery, as um, things that should not be ends in themselves. And he says that any bodily health and vigor, it is good to exercise and everything, but we must exercise the mind. We should only exercise the body as a place where a healthy mind can reside. Without a healthy mind, only exercising the body, only building muscles will not help us out. And next, we come to a very interesting idea of um, in the essay, we will get to it and he is quoting from the epistle to Timothy. He is saying bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable. He is saying bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. He is quoting this from the epistle to Timothy. And uh, in utilitarian Franklin says, eat and drink such an exact quantity as suits the constitution of thy body in reference to the services of the mind. So, the mind must be serviced, the mind should not be indulged in uh, only a betterment of the body, but the body and the mind, the mind should look after itself. And now we come to Epictetus and this is a very interesting part of the essay where we are, uh, go through the ideas aphuia and euphuia. So, Epictetus says that it is a sign of aphuia that is of a nature not finely tempered to give yourself up to things which relate to body to make for instance a great fuss about exercise, a great fuss about eating, a great fuss about drinking, a great fuss about walking, a great fuss about riding. So, we see that in this uh, society also if you see that there is food that is marked as for the calorie conscious, this food that is marked as you should uh, there is so many dietitian and nutritionists coming in and but what they fail to consider at all times it is like the body as an end to itself where you have all the calories mentioned behind a food packet, but as much stress we give to the body these days, we do not give it to the mind. And that is what Epictetus called in Greek times a uh, sign of aphuia and he contrasts with euphuia which is a finely tempered nature, a coarsely tempered nature, gives exactly the notion of perfection as culture brings us to conceive of it, a perfection in which the characters of beauty and intelligence are both present which unites the two noblest things. And what are these two noblest things as Swift, he is now quoting Swift, Jonathan Swift. Jonathan Swift in his battle of books makes two distinctions between the spider and the honeybee. So, according to Swift, the spider makes webs and he eats in his web and there are empty husks of insects lying in that web and it is a dirty, it is a not a very beautiful thing to see. And here we see that there is a very specific idea of beauty that is coming up, but uh, contrast it to the bee, the honey bee who makes wax and honey and wax is the source of light and honey is the source of sweetness. So, Swift also poses the honey bee as a more person of culture than the spider here and Arnold's essay borrows from that. So, sweetness and light is actually a reference to the honey bee, the work of the honey bee that it does all its life the gathering of honey and the creation of wax. The wax gives us light and the honey gives us sweetness and it is from the battle of the books. And Euphrates is the man who tends towards sweetness and light and Aphis is precisely our Philistine. So, he is saying that we should be more Euphoristic than Aphoristic. And he makes a, an observation that culture is like of spirit with poetry. We must remember that Arnold was also a very prominent poem of poet of the Victorian times. So, no wonder that he sees in poetry the prospect that culture that it can further culture follows one law with poetry. I have called religion a more important manifestation of human nature than poetry 
because it has worked on a broader scale of perfection and with greater masses of men. But the idea of beauty and of human nature perfect on all sides, which is a dominant idea of poetry, is a true and invaluable idea. So, but if we see that a uh, lot of important books of religion has also been written with the help of poetry, they engage poetry. So, poetry and religion are not some two binary terms, two distinguishable terms that we can use, but oftentimes they are correlated with each other, entangled with each other. And uh, there is a book by Ellen Scurry called Beauty and Being Just, where she addresses the positive aspects of beauty and she also points out how in different times of society beauty as a category has been downgraded but she she also questions for a re-evaluation of beauty where we learn to see beauty for what it is and probably make a, a finer judgment about it and he's saying here that inward peace comes from a cultivation of culture and he's saying what I may call about inward peace and satisfaction, the peace and satisfaction which are reached as we draw near to complete spiritual perfection and not merely to moral perfection or rather to relative moral perfection. So the Victorian times were a time of great moral turbulence and um, so the morality of Victorian times was very high and we see that, um, so we have a term called Victorian morality and Arnold in this essay does not say that morality is not important, that it is something we can discount, but he is saying that it is a spiritual perfection that goes beyond morality, the confines of morality. So culture is a point where you will understand morality on your own if you have culture, then have morality pushed upon you from an outside authority. And he is saying again, the religion itself, I need hardly say supplies in abundance this grand language, the grand language of poetry and everything, of culture, which is really the severest criticism of such an incomplete perfection as alone we have yet reached through our religious organizations. So again like Arnold is critiquing not religion, but organization of religion, organized religion and to a certain extent as we shall see later how Puritanism, Protestantism has failed England in this project. And he is saying that Puritanism has helped England towards moral development because Puritanism found so adequate an expression as in the religious organization of the dependents. And he now mentions a newspaper called the Nonconformist. The tagline of it is the dissidence of dissent and the Protestantism of Protestant religion. Now it is very interesting to see that um, what we have downplayed these days in society that Arnold brings out a view of culture where it has a very important part to play in society. Well, it is not something that is books that we read when we have leisure as opposed to worldly activities or important activities, but culture that shapes how we look at the world, culture that helps us become better person. So we see here he has already mentioned a newspaper, the Nonconformist, and later we will see also he will mention the Daily Telegraph. So he is already talking about the magazines we read, the newspapers that we read, the books that we read that play such an important part in how we conceive of society, how we order society. So instead of pushing culture as a background force in society, it is kind of bringing it foreground, into the foreground because it, 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 it is about, it helps us to think about things, it organizes our thought around things. Again he says morality is indispensable. So, he is never saying that morality should be let go because in Victorian terms we have understood that morality was a huge thing. So he is never saying that morality should be abundant. But he is saying also that the Protestantism slowly gave birth to Puritanism and Puritanism was a very severe, a very ascetic form of religion and we see the Americans when they went there, they, they followed a high form of Puritanism. And he is also criti criticizing that form of puritanism, that form of moral asceticism, that form of very aggressive religiosity. And he is saying that if the pilgrim fathers, so the pilgrim fathers are the people who went from England to America uh, and looked around and uh, traced new, uh, the pilgrim fathers are people who went from Europe to America and uh, looked around the continent and settled there. And he is saying that uh, if the uh, Virgil and Shakespeare were riding with the Pilgrim Fathers, if they were sailing with the Pilgrim Fathers, they will find uh, the company of the Pilgrim Fathers very, very hard to bear. And here we see that um, 
He is saying that intolerable company, Shakespeare and Virgil would have found them. So, here we see that Arnold is not proposing a very ghettoized culture, not a very segregated society, but a society where all kinds of people come in contact with them, that where we must encounter all different kinds of people and unless we have a certain parity among other people, these encounters can become very problematic. And he is saying that a newspaper had asked Professor Huxley that how uh, it has pointed out uh, in the crowd that had uh, uh, that had gathered in on Epsom day, Epsom, at Epsom on Derby day that um, how do you propose to make this crowd better and Arnold asks the reporter back that with your religion, with your kind of religion and religious aggressiveness, how do you proof, uh, pref, uh, pro, how do you propose to make society better. How is an ideal of life so unlovely, so unattractive, so narrow, so far removed from a true and satisfying ideal of human perfection as is the life of your religious organization as you yourself manage it to conquer and transform all this vice and hideousness. So, he is very critical of religion that is restrictive that tells us not to do that, not to do that here. He is more about religion that gives us a freedom to cultivate culture. And he is saying here, children of God, children of God is it an immense pretension and we as we mentioned in the beginning that this was written 10 years after um, Darwin's origin of species was published. So, no wonder that this children of God sounds more like a pretension to Arnold than ever before. So, previously humans probably have gotten around with saying these things, but now after Darwin had expounded his um, his um, origin of species, it becomes harder and harder to pretend that we come directly from God. And again, he is uh, criticizing London for its role in uh, its unutterable external hideousness and with its internal canker of public against us and private um, opulentia. So, this means private um, opulence and public misery. So, as uh, individuals are getting richer, the public in its whole is getting poorer. As we already mentioned that the 1 percent in the world now possesses more than 99 percent of its riches. So, and London, this critique of London will only get worse with time as we shall see in the modern times. As we mentioned that Arnold is kind of anticipating the modern times already. He is seeing that what the problems of modern times will come, what will cause further disillusionment in people of culture like James Joyce or T. S. Um, Eliot or Virginia Woolf. So, for uh, in at the end of Mrs. Dalloway, um, uh, Virginia Woolf uh, notes how they, through the death of Septimus Smith, how London is a very, very unempathetic city. It has nothing to say about how a beautiful person like Septimus Smith dies. And in T. S. Eliot's Wasteland, we see London is accused that as as an unreal city that has that has filled the world with um, unambitious people. Again, he provides us another definition of culture where he says culture, however shows its single minded love of perfection, its desire simply to make reason and the will of God prevail, its freedom from fanaticism, but its attitude towards all this machinery even while it insists that it is machinery. So, here we see that the religion that Arnold is espousing that he is for is without fanaticism, it does not have fanaticism in it, it is a religion of beauty. And here also I would like to take a notice like Previously, how we saw the word endless was repeated. Here, Arnold is again stressing his point of being sacrificed. So, he is saying that many people are getting sacrificed to this very um, Philistinic attitude to life and this sacrifice here is not the religious sacrifice in religious terms where or martyrdom. So, a religious sacrifice will put a person at the level of martyrdom. It has a meaning to that sacrifice, but the sacrifice that Arnold mentioned here, the sacrifice of people is a meaningless sacrifice. It is not some a religious one that can elevate people to the status of martyrdom. And um, Arnold uh, next comes to the Oxford movement, where he is um, upholding the ideas of Dr. Cardinal Newman and everyone else that uh, the Oxford movement was associated with. The Oxford movement tried to bring in some elements of Catholicism into the Anglican church, which they thought would kind of reduce its rigidity. But he says that the force that um, broke the Oxford movement was liberalism. It is it's, it's about local self-government in politics and free trade unrestricted competition. So, this free trade is also something that is 
cons continuing today and it continues in the form of neoliberalism. And neoliberalism has kind of privileged certain first world countries against third world countries. And while it has made the, made the first world countries richer, it has made the third world countries poorer. So we can see that Arnold was right in his critique of free trade of liberalism that has taken a much worse route now in society. And he is saying that even though the Oxford movement has failed, Oxford University as a place and the people of Oxford have still conquered society because it has the center because it is in this manner that the sentiment of Oxford for beauty and sweetness conquers and in this manner long may it continue to conquer. So, Arnold is not dissolution by losses in society, but the losses that society suffers at the hand of this liberal forces, this free trade forces, but he says that we will still continue with culture, with a love for beauty and truth that will forever continue. And here again he criticizes a person called Mr. Bright who asks the Englishman to take pride over the railroads he has built, the manufacturings that they have produced and the cargoes they have built. But Arnold is saying that they are, this is a very philistinic idea again that railroads, manufacturing and cargoes are not something that you take pride of. For Arnold also it is like very adamant in this way that only culture is something that can be a source of pride. And he comes to call this uh, faith in um, machines and this faith that railroads and cargoes that we build are important and they are the height of human perfection and achievement, a Jacobinism. So, he is against this sort of Jacobinism and he says that culture is the eternal opponent of the two things which are the signal marks of Jacobinism, its fairness and its addiction to the abstract system. And again he goes back to the Greek times and, and the Roman times to show what culture played in the times of antiquity to show light on how it can save us now. And he says, the excellent German historian of the mythology of Rome, Preller, relating the introduction at Rome under the Tarquins, the worship of Apollo, the god of light, healing and reconciliation, observed that it was not so much the Tarquins who brought to Rome the new worship of Apollo as current in the mind of the Roman people, which said powerfully at the time towards a new worship of this kind and away from the old run of Latin and Sabine religious ideas and it continues with the idea human affairs. So, this is also a very Foucauldian idea of government. So, Foucault later says that power can be snatched from the hands of government by the people. The people through constituting certain practices can make sure of that. And Arnold here is also saying that, that authority we cannot trust authority to always make the changes for the better. If people find that there is something changes that must be made, people must make them the, themselves. And he goes to Benjamin Franklin, he criticizes Franklin, he first hails Franklin in a very satiric manner as one of the best wits of American culture, then he finds issues with what Franklin says and then he goes on to criticize Bentham as well for his um, utilitarianism and Bentham is a person also we have to remember that he invented the idea of panopticon which we can see was a prison of system which was a surveillance system that again Foucault criticizes and if we go to the cellular jail in, in uh, three, four, almost over. And, um, so, Bentham uh, pr pr proposes uh, the idea of um, panopticon which Foucault also criticizes later on and he talks and we can see it is a prison system, a pr system of surveillance and um, if we go to the cellular jail in um, uh, Andaman Islands, we can see the cellular jail is built upon this principle of the panopticon created by Bentham. And here actually Arnold makes the statement that I am delivered from the bondage of Bentham. So, Bentham is an utilitarian, is a builder of prisons from which Arnold wants to distance himself. It is not the part of colonialism that he would like to associate himself with that builds these prisons and everything. He says, be ye not called a rabbi, Jacobinism loves a rabbi. So, he is asking us to again like as I mentioned that culture for him is a discursive thing than an authoritarian thing. So, he is saying asking us to move away from having this rabbi, rabbiistic figures where we have to listen to one person to understand what is good in society. Culture does not prefer rabbis. And we will conclude now. So, let us um, read this. So, the he is concluding also that the pursuit of perfection then is the pursuit of sweetness and light. And we see that these ideas of perfection, of harmony, of harmonious perfection, of well rounded development are the ideas that have been brought up in this essay time and again. It is way to make reason and God prevail. He works for machinery, he who works for hatred only works for confusion. 
culture looks beyond machinery, culture hates hatred. So, any form of hatred, any form of discrimination that might be in society, culture hates itself that. So, it's here culture can also be a vindictive force like the gods, but, but Arnold kind of poses it like that. And he says that it is the function of culture to aim for this sweetness and light. And, ma, and again as he says that must have sweetness and light for as many as possible. So, it is not again an elitist thing, but a socialist thing. It does not try to teach down to the level of inferior classes. It does not try to win them for this or that sect of its own with ready made judge or watchwords. It seeks to do away with classes. Here we almost see he is anticipating the Marxist tenets that Marx will slowly start writing to make all live in an atmosphere of sweetness and light and use ideas as it uses them itself freely to be nourished and not to be bound by them. This is again he says as a social idea, social idea, men of culture are the true apostles of equality. So, and he concludes the essay by giving some more examples of people that he considers people of culture. But I hope this lecture will has helped you to understand this essay, Culture and Anarchy, better. Please let us know in the forum if you have any questions. Thank you.